amazing grace. Be seated. I do want to share a card with you from uh, Pam, who's already texted me to tell you uh, that she misses you this morning. <laughs> uh, this, this is the beautiful card she sent uh, to you. And the inside says, On my path of darkness, you became my light. To Carbondale Church of Christ. I am so grateful for everyone and everything that has been put in my life at, at the right moment. Thank you for staying in my life and leading me on the right path. Thank you for your genuine love and care that you have shown me, and I'm looking forward to learning and growing more on my path to true happiness and fulfillment, and I'm so glad that I'm learning and growing with you at Carbondale Church of Christ. Um, it was it, as much as she wanted to see her sister, <laughs> and was looking forward to that. Um, it was very difficult for her to leave, especially having just uh, had such a wonderful Sunday with us last week, and and uh, week during the week this week. Uh, it's a, it's a true joy to to see the uh, excitement and uh, the light in someone's eyes who's truly uh, touched and brought to the Lord. From, yes, a very, very dark place. And I appreciate very much all that you've done, as she said. This is the second lesson in a series on overcoming evil. I think I kept you from seeing that slide last week. Jumping right into the text, as I did. Um, I'm using the book of James because, as I began to look into the book of James, this word evil kept appearing. It's five times in uh, four chapters. And uh, it seems that James is, is quite concerned about the effect that evil can still have on us as Christians as we're trying to make our way in this world. And so as he writes uh, in the first verse of, of James 1, he calls himself a bondservant uh, of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he writes to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. I made the connection with you last week. This is likely the scattering that occurred at the death of Stephen and how the, the Jews that, that had become Christians on the day of Pentecost and shortly thereafter were, were just sent literally around the world, many of them leaving their homes, some, of course, returning to their homes. But uh, there was a lot of hardship and uh, not just the persecution that they were actually fleeing. And so we'll be in chapter 2 this morning, and as I did last week, and this is not my typical practice, I will be reading all 26 verses throughout uh, this lesson. The first section introduces the subject that I uh, talked to the kids about this morning at Kids on Fire. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes. Now just stop there a minute. Let that, let that image sink into your brain. Two different people walk in, but they look completely different from one another. And so what is our action? What is our response? And you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes. And you say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there. Or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Now as... As he begins this text, I, I want to show you a picture of words, but this is the picture of what, what, the way you should have seen the room as you walked in this morning. You should have seen our glorious Lord Jesus Christ and brother, sister, brother, sister, brother, sister, brother, sister. As you look at your brothers and sisters, you see no 
there is no particular distinction, particularly in the light of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. His name and two titles. He is everything. So how is it that we've gone down to the very bottom and we've, we've said, oh look, this is not like that. He starts us out saying, your perspective is all wrong. You're, you're emphasizing the wrong thing. But he also very clearly states, you have become judges with evil motives. Now the one thing you do not want if you have to face a judge is an evil judge. You, you really don't want that. And so when someone comes into our assembly and they feel that they have encountered an evil judge, like, like the kids this morning, well, that's not fair. That's not good. This isn't right. I can see this from a mile away. And what is it in this case that he's talking about? It's personal favoritism. I'm going to play favorites. But on a personal level, there's no rhyme or reason to what I'm going to pick. Well, if you're under nine, then you get candy this morning. Well, where'd you come up with that number? How come it can't be nine? How come it can't be ten, they say? Well, there's no reason. It's just personal. And if you do favoritism based on personal things, no one stands a chance. It's all up to you. In this particular case, he uses the example of rich versus poor. This is the, maybe one of the oldest classic difficulties in any culture in any time. Those who have and those who have less. If we treat people differently based on whether they're rich or they're poor, or our perception of whether they're rich or poor, we're basically treating other people with the question, now, what can you do for me? Well, if you're rich and I want to be around you because, I mean, something may fall off. I might get some influence here. I might learn something. Now, I, I, I stand to gain if I spend time. Well, I don't have anything to gain with you. You're poor. And, and James says, that, that's just wrong. In fact, it's not just wrong. It's actually evil. And, and we think, oh, well, I didn't know it was actually evil. evil. Yeah, it's all the way. To evil. And so he talks again about this rich and poor thing, and he's already done this in chapter 1, but he comes back to it again, verse 5, he said, listen, my beloved brethren, God, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he promised to those who love him? But you've dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you've been called? This rich and poor, in, our, in their experience, running from those who are persecuting. And by the way, those in the Sanhedrin were pretty well to do. I'm just saying, they were. They had power, they had resources, and they liked wielding both. And that was one of the problems. He says, it's, this is what you're running into as you're losing your possessions, as you're being hauled into court. It's this distinction that you want to make in your assembly that's costing you right now. Is that really the way you want to play other people when you don't like that? And what does that remind you of? <laughs> that's kind of sounded like the golden rule, is it not? Well, he goes beyond the golden rule. He says, if however, verse 7, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, the second commandment. If you fulfill that, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And speaking of transgressors, whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. That's the way the law works. He who said do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder... You become a transgressor of the law. You only have to offend in one point. You, you really cannot say to the officer who stops you, but, but, but I've been driving this whole day under the speed limit. He said, yeah, and I caught you the one minute you didn't. 
you're guilty. It doesn't matter. As soon as you transgress, you're a transgressor. It doesn't matter how long. It doesn't matter, in your opinion, how important. If, if we're going to look at judgment, and that seems to be what they were doing, all right, let's approach this from judgment. Well, the judgment is pretty harsh, really, out there in life. And so he says, verses 12 and 13, so speak. This, this, is, this is how you want to run your life. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty, which he's brought up in chapter 1. Judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So in this first part, basically it's pretty hard to miss. Partiality is considered evil. It is not like God. Here we've come into God's presence. We've come with others who want to be like God. We say we want to be like God. And then the first thing we do is dishonor the poor man. He said, well, that's not like God. That's not what God would do. What would God do? Well, he'd be faithful. And by the way, he says, it's not faithful either. James begins this section, and, and I believe it is the whole chapter, talking about holding our faith. So, <laughs> it, it's, it's kind of like saying, okay, I have faith. Now, here it is. I've got it. I'm holding it. I'm going to carry it around. I'm going to use this in my life. Okay, if you're going to hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, you don't want to let favoritism and partiality water that down. That's unfaithful. Not only are we not like God, we're not like Him in faithfulness either. And then he brings up being judged by the law. And I was kind of thinking, okay, commit uh, adultery and murder. That's the law of Moses. He, and then he mentions the royal law. Well, which one's that? And then he talks about the law of liberty. And then he says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Well, I'm confused. Well, that's, that's how it feels when someone's being partial against you. You can't figure out where they're coming from. Where'd you get that standard? Where'd you come up with that number? Where'd you come up with that much riches and that little resources? You're going to be judged by the law. Jesus said it earlier. The standards you use is going to get used on you. So just remember that. Matthew 7. What we can't miss is that judgment comes. We are going to be judged. It will either be merciless without mercy, or it will be full of mercy, merciful. How do I want to be judged? That's probably the standard I should use, as Jesus said, against someone else. Mercy will triumph over judgment. You can't use both. If I'm going to be merciful, then that will overcome a harsh judgment against me. If I want to use judgment against someone else and say, well, you know, you don't really have enough. I've thrown mercy out and I've chosen judgment over mercy, according to James. Now, you may think that he changes subjects, but I do not believe he does. Verses 14 through 26 talk about faith and works. But we're still talking about holding our faith and behaving properly. What use is it, brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace. Be warmed and be filled. And yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? Now, now, go back to the beginning of the chapter. I've met a rich man and I've met a poor man. I want the poor man to stand over there. Oh, really? Well, let's talk about what faith would do. Faith would take care of the issue. According to James. That faith that wants to just talk 
isn't the right one. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. He calls it that faith. He introduces three kinds of faith in this short few verses. The first one is dead faith. Faith without works is dead. Talk without action is dead. Anything that leaves others in a needy condition, it, it just, it's, it's ineffective. It, it's dead. There's nothing living about that. Can that faith save us? No. And it sure doesn't help the needy person either. It's <laughs> just saying that's a problem for them too. Jesus said it this way, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Dead faith. Talk, but no action. Calling out to God and saying, save me, save me. And Jesus says, you know, that's really not going to be enough on the judgment day. Saying you knew me won't be enough. Here's a second one that won't be enough as well. You believe God is one. See, that's the correct position about God, right? That's the correct belief, the right doctrine. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? So we have a second kind of faith here, but this time he uses a different standard. This is demonic faith. Now if you think about Jesus and his encounters with demons as he walked the earth, demons were not atheists. They believe in God. They weren't unsure about what to think about God. They knew who Jesus was and they would openly confess Him, something the Jews would not do, and the very thing that Jesus says, if you can't do this, you're not going to make it. You have to recognize me for who I am. You have to attribute that and confess that. Or your faith is not saving faith. Will the demons qualify? Oh my! I mean, this is, you know, really kind of hard to say, but the demons had more faith than the people who walked and witnessed the works of Jesus and scoffed at Him and rejected Him. Demons were better off. Where do the demons go short? Well, their mind knows the right thing. Their heart, they're, you know, they get it. They're willing to acknowledge who Jesus is. But they shudder, they fear, they shrink away. They don't want to be around Jesus, they want to get away from Jesus. Have you come to destroy us before the time? All they can think of is that Jesus has come to kill them. Well, that's not like God, is it? <laughs> Demonic faith is full of fear. Folks, I've I got to talk to us about what's going on. I, I met with a very dear friend this week. And, and for a solid 10 or 15 minutes, heard all the reasons I should be absolutely scared to death. And apparently, it was obvious that it wasn't landing because I got asked what I thought about everything that had been said. And I said, well, I'm just not concerned. And I'm not going to tell you what it all was. Because you, all you do is just turn the radio on, you'll hear it all. Just get on social media, there it is. You already know all this stuff. But I'm telling you, if your response to what you're hearing is fear, you are being demonic. That is not the right response. You can know the right thing. You can know the right one. But if that only makes you afraid, then you don't really know Him, do you? Because that's not what He wants you to be. So let's look at a couple of people who responded correctly. Verses 21 through 23 and then beyond that. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? When he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? 
You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, it says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. The demons believe and tremble. Abraham didn't just believe in God. Abraham believed God. He believed what God promised he could fulfill. And so God says, now that's righteous. And God wanted to be friends with Abraham. And Abraham wasn't afraid to be God's friend. He was honored to be God's friend. He wanted to walk with God anywhere God wanted to go. Now that's faith. Using works. You see that a man is justified by works and not faith alone. In the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. Well, wait a minute. She can't be faithful. She's a harlot. Well, we're back to the first of the chapter again. Oh, you've committed a sin? Well, you're not welcome here because we, of course, have not committed any sins. Oh, <laughs> doesn't that sound ridiculous? Oh, you're a harlot? You're a druggie? You're a this, you're a that? Yeah, well, I'm a... You know, I got mine too. So do you. We can't stop at the thing that used to define us. She did the right thing when it counted. She trusted God when everybody in town thought God was the enemy. And she let God's spies go free and safe. And God said, now that's faith. And she's in the Faith Hall of Fame, Hebrews 11. This is called dynamic faith, powerful faith, active faith. It, yes, involves the mind. We believe in God. It involves the heart. We actually believe God, want to be friends with God. But it involves the will, and, and it takes us toward action. Not enough simply to think things or believe things without acting on them. Abraham believed God and his faith was perfected. He had some faith when he believed God's promise and he acted like he believed God's promise. He walked with God and God walked with him. And his faith got stronger and better and more complete, the word for perfection. So we have this faith and works. <laughs> and this is the solution to the problem of partiality. I need to believe in the right person. I need to believe the right thing about the right person. I need to have a relationship with the right person. And that means it will inform my relationships with everyone else. And so faith with works puts away partiality. Well, you know, they walked in and I thought, ooh, that's a rough life you've been living. That's fine. Okay, so you thought it. Just keep it inside because it's not fit for speaking. Yeah, people live rough lives. And when they come to Jesus with a rough life, He can smooth it over and heal it and empower it to be so much more. If we've not powerfully seen that repeatedly this summer, I don't know what we were looking at. Faith is a demonstration. It needs works to show how it looks. We have faith that demonstrates by works that the faith is really there. It's when you want to have a relationship with someone and you give them a gift, it's a demonstration of your love. You say, well, I, you know, I love them. Well, did you tell them? Well, yeah, I say it all the time. Well, have you done anything to show you love them? You might want to add that as a demonstration of that love. Let's look at these conclusions. 
each one is equally valuable. The gospel changes our perspective when we see another human being. And I, I've, I've talked about this in various ways already. I, just, I want us to understand that the way the world looks at people and the way we used to work at people and the way our boss looks at employees, those are not the right standard for how to live in faith before God in His presence, especially in His assembly. Each one we meet is equally valuable. This is how Paul said it in Galatians 3. For you are all sons, meaning heirs, which he says at the end. You are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. You get what he got as an heir. It is based on this oneness. And that's why there's no room for partiality. But secondly, not just partiality, any sin against one another is evil. We could just take our New Testament and just open it up and start reading and, and we, sadly, we're a pretty high chance that we'll find something that we probably need to stop doing where one another is concerned. Stop being angry with each other. Be encouraging with each other. You know, all kinds of things, all kinds of problems existed in the early church. And James calls it the royal law of the kingdom. Lucian talked about kingdom this morning. This is a kingdom. There's our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, and then there's everyone else. We're all subjects of the king. It, James and John wanted to say, well, you know, can I sit on the right and on the left? <laughs> Jesus said, yes, don't look at it that way. That, that's, that's not what we're here for. That's not the idea. The royal law says everyone is treated equally. And if I do anything to belie that, it's sinful, it's evil, and it shouldn't exist. Thirdly, love applies to all. And, and I know you've heard me already make this point, but I want to make it one step further. Is the rich man and the poor man of James 2, are they a part of the congregation? Or are they the guests who come into the congregation? Oh well, I mean, it says, you know, do good to all, especially those of the household of faith. So, I mean, our brothers and sisters, I mean, they're the, you know, they're, they're up here. Slow down. Really? Have we not learned this this summer? There are the brothers and sisters that you know who are already your brothers and sisters. And then there's the future brother or sister that comes in. And I, I have to say, you powerfully showed Pam, Greg, and many others this summer. You've powerfully showed we want you to be a part of us we want you to be just one of us. We don't want to make a distinction. Well, you know, whenever you finally make your decision, we'll, we'll start treating you well. <laughs> That's not going to happen. They won't be here. It's, it's right and proper. Love applies to all. It applies to the current brother and sister, and it applies to the future brother and sister. And if that's the way you approach everyone in the world, they either already are or they could be, how about I treat them like they could be? That's the right way. And lastly, mercy or judgment. What do you want? I still need God's mercy. Don't you? I think what James is saying here is even if you're forgiven, even when you're an heir, you could still be judged. 
you start acting evil, and what will Jesus say at the judgment? Depart from me, you who practice iniquity. I never knew you. The relationship is a current relationship. It's a thriving relationship with Christ. It's one we keep in the right way. If I give up that right relationship and I start acting like someone who's never going to be a future brother or sister, judgment can still come. And James is very clear to say, we have to remember we're going to be judged. Even us kids, even the heirs, even the ones who've been forgiven. If you do things that require mercy, but you show no need for mercy, that's not a good place to be. And so the last verse of the chapter, as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So you get this, Okay, so do the right thing. Conclusion. Someone walks in, do the right thing. Someone is in and they're struggling with something, do the right thing. Someone has a need, do the right thing. <laughs> Show that this faith in Christ really makes a difference in your life. And so at this point in the lesson in our service, we always offer the Lord's invitation. We say, do you need what Christ has to offer? Do you need the promise that he made to Abraham fulfilled in your life? Would you like to be one of the heirs? Would you like to be one of those who are truly his? Would you like to be the friend of God? That's what he calls you to be, and we invite you as one of ours. Will you come while we stand and sing?